Have you ever heard of Serpent Mound in Ohio? It's a very mysterious space. It is the largest snake effigy in the world, and it's re really pretty much a complete mystery. I'm a Vedic astrologer, so I'm going to share with you guys the mystery of Serpent Mound, because it, most of the people who have talked about this mound have not been uh, professional astrologers in the occult field who really know this stuff. So I'm here to tell you guys, Serpent Mound is a shrine to Rahu and Ketu and to the sun and moon and the planets and the zodiac itself. Hear me out, okay? <laughs> Let me make my case. So Serpent Mound is, in the 80s, Serpent Mound was discovered to be aligned to the solstices, to the summer solstice, and to the equinox and the winter solstice. And so I'll try to pull up the image here for you guys, but the serpent's mouth perfectly lines up with the sun at sunset on the summer solstice every year. Now that's very cool. So the summer solstice is the tropical zodiac, again too. So it is not the sidereal zodiac. Sorry for a lot of traditional Vedic astrologers who are just getting into this. Tropical zodiac is actually what the ancients all used and we have so much evidence of this now. Um, so this structure is not aligned to anything with the sidereal zodiac. It's aligned to the tropical zodiac with the summer solstice, uh, which is the beginning the sun, of the sun entering Cancer, the side of the moon. So that, that little circle that the snake's eating is probably the moon. That's a hint right there. And it's lined up to where the sun sets right along that little gap in the... Uh, cliffs in the mountains in Serpent Mound. Every, every year that happens. Now lots of ancient sites are aligned to this solar calendar or solar zodiac. Uh, Stonehenges, for example, lots of other places. So it's very common for an ancient site to be aligned to the solstices and equinoxes and therefore have the tropical zodiac encoded into its structure. Um, but what's particularly unique about Serpent Mound is that it has the lunar, uh, the lunar cycle encoded into it. I almost said lunar zodiac, but it's not like it doesn't have nakshatras involved. I don't want you to think that. The 18.6 year lunar cycle of the lunar nodes, which is Rahu and Ketu, is encoded into Serpent Mound. I'll try to show you the image there, but the moon rise and the moon set at different times during that during the year and during an 18 year period is encoded there and then nearby the real kicker is that nearby there see because serpent mound is a part of a bunch of what they call like mound complexes there was some sort of society they call it the hopewell that we really don't know much about them they were mound builders and they built all these mounds in different um important ceremonial sites or sites for whatever we really don't know so nearby serpent mound is another mound called uh the observatory mound the observation mound of the observatory mound because it happens to be a line to where the full moon will rise directly above this mound every 18.6 years so perfectly encoding rahu and k2 into it so we have an observatory that is aligned and based on Rahu and Ketu, and then not many miles away we have a mound of a serpent eating an orb. What does that remind you guys of, Vedic astrologers, okay? Rahu and Ketu are serpents, they're serpent deities. Rahu is a serpent's head, and or sorry, a head with a serpent body, and Ketu is a serpent body without a head or they're kind of depicted different ways but we all know that they're depicted as serpents or dragons and in the mythology what do they do they swallow up the sun and the moon every six months you know as part of the old legends that i don't need to go into here because i've explained it in previous videos but um so we have an observatory based on observing this Rahu and Ketu, this serpent cycle of them eating the moon and sun. And then nearby we have 
a mound depicting a serpent eating a moon or sun. And see, I think it's actually like probably the moon if you want to pick one, but it's a, it's ambiguous. It's meant to be ambiguous. If they, if they wanted it to be depicted as a moon, they would have created a crescent symbol, which would have obviously symbolized the moon. But they made it a sun or a moon to make it ambiguous because it symbolized how Rahu and Ketu eclipse both. They eat both the sun and moon. So this is what that site is actually encoding but unfortunately most people like even graham hancock who i love or all these people who go and visit it they're not astrologers so they don't see this and they don't realize how rahu and ketu is the most important thing in the birth chart in ast all of astrology the eclipses are what determine everything so if there's anything to make a shrine to it would be rahu and ketu or if there's anything to encode it, that is worth encoding for an ancient culture and what this ancient culture I mean what this tells us is how important astrology and even the eclipses and Rahu and Ketu were to this ancient culture and they say this goes back to at least 300 BC but maybe even older so that oval to head section where the where the head eats the the Sun or the moon that is that direct alignment to the summer solstice, but then also the winter solstice, which would be the beginning of Capricorn, and the equinox, which would be the beginning of Libra or Aries, is also encoded into it. So the entire like celestial cross of the zodiac, the four angles of the chart, are all encoded into this. And what's also really neat is that this is Serpent Mount is located at a site where a meteorite crashed. In ancient times and so you know there's a direct implication of heavenly connection there's a direct cosmic connection because it's built on a site where a meteorite crashed down um, now one of the other really interesting things that is just obviously like almost too obvious to even notice is that the image of serpent mound has seven coils or seven straight parts of the snake's uh, body. I'll try to pull up the image over here so you can see. That's the seven grahas. So, and then that coil at the bottom is like Rahu, Rahu, the, uh, the root chalk, or you could actually think of it either way, but it's like the coiling tail at the bottom is Rahu or Ketu, and the head at the top is the other one, Ketu or Rahu. You know what I mean? The extreme points at the end of the serpent. And, you know, just so you guys know that the, this whole idea of the serpent mound, uh, the, the idea of the Ouroboros, the snake eating its tail, was a symbol of Rahu and Ketu as well in other cultures. So we see this, the importance of Rahu and Ketu in the eclipses all over ancient cultures. But, yeah, so it's really interesting how we have this meteorite connection implying a dirt, like, look to the heavens, look to the heavens for the answer of what the mystery of this place is. But then we also have the the Navagrahas, the nine planets, the seven classical planets plus Rahu and Ketu are like drawn into the snake with the seven straight planes. And you know that on an esoteric level, on a spiritual level, the seven planes represent the seven chakras and the planets relate to the seven planes and seven chakras as well. And on the spiritual path, those are the levels of reality we reach, you know, as we ascend spiritually. So this ancient culture was probably a very enlightened and very spiritually awakened culture to have just, you know, it would be very coincidental for them to happen of all these parts of this, this mound and earthen work line up. So I think even if uh, Serpent Mound was not a literal depiction of a snake eating the sun and moon like Rahu and Ketu, if, even if it was aligned to the lunar zodiac and the solar zodiac, you would think, sorry not lunar zodiac the lunar cycle and the solar cycle um, which again the the solar cycle takes only one year to to observe lunar cycle takes 18 years to observe so this is a much more serious observational culture right put it even if that wasn't a serpent and you had all these weird astrological alignments you would think wow this this culture is probably very into astrology and might have even been into might have tracked rahu and k2 but the fact that it's a freaking snake you know what I mean? Eating the sun and the moon. It's just so obvious. It's just kind of hilarious to me as an astrologer that all these um, 
you know, these days everybody is an occult mystery expert on YouTube, right? It's like, what have y'all actually been studying and doing? How did you not see this obvious connection? If you read old, old books and old occult things, you would just see this so obviously. Anyways, that's neither here nor there. Now I want to share some interesting, just some interesting history on um, America, you know, because America has so much fascinating history that does con we weave into astrology um, and it connects to this whole serpent thing. So all over the Americas, actually, there is so much evidence of a serpent worshiping culture. And that's really how we need to see this serpent mound. We need to see this in the context of all that. It's actually really unfortunate and super racist that people initially didn't think that all these Native American cultures were, were connected, like the Ohio uh, Hopewell Indian culture, the Mississippi River literally just takes you right down to the bottom and then that's where there are all these cool mound complexes down in, you know, in the south, like where I live or Louisiana and all these places. And even here where I live, literally I live, my house is on top of a oyster shell mound from Native Americans living like long ago, um, interestingly enough. But uh, this this serpent thing, like we really need to see this in connection to everything else. So one of the most obvious things is that in South America, this the Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl, I'm probably not saying that name right, but the feathered serpent was this deity who came and enlightened that culture and helped, and he was like a Vishnu or an avatar who came and brought all this knowledge and wisdom and everything to, to South Americans. And he had different names. So I'm going to have to read some of this here because I'm not an expert on this. So Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent deity, this is what, uh, if I'm correct, this is what the uh, the temple of the sun in Teotihuacan, again, not saying it right, Teotihuacan or whatever, the Mexican complex where you have that temple of the sun, and you, I'm sure you've heard about how on the solstice, again, tropical zodiac, the uh, the solstices and equinoxes are at a certain point, there's a, a point where the the snake statue at the bottom, the shadow on the steps creates a winding coil of its tail. So it creates a snake at, an, a right, at the right auspicious astrological time, which is again calculated tropically and not sidereally. Also, this is where it gets really interesting. Um, the Incas called uh, America Amaruca, which literally meant like land of the serpent people or Amaru. Amaru meant serpent. Um, Manly P. Hall explained it this way, quote unquote, these children of the sun adore the plumed serpent who is the messenger of the sun. He was Quetzalcoatl in Mexico, Gucumutz in, I'm sorry, another place I don't know how to pronounce it. And in Peru, he was called Amaru. Um, so, it was supposedly, and then he goes on to kind of explain that it was basically an entire linked culture from the northwest coast of, of North America all the way down to South America. And I happen to rem rem recall now, as I'm thinking of this, the Hopi Indians in the southwest desert, they have rituals where they put poisonous snakes into their mouth and out and do all these really cool, fascinating rituals with snakes, never get bit. In fact, um, I stayed in the Hopi land one time and... Uh, talk with a guy for a long time about it, they literally let the kids watch after the poisonous snakes. So when they catch all the poisonous snakes for these rituals, they put them in a, like a big cage and then they let the kids take care of them. And no one has ever been bit by them. And see, us yogis know why this is because snakes know your heart. They're so sensitive to vibrations by always being on the ground and being attuned to vibrations. They, yogis say snakes know heart. You know, they know your heart. And so they'll never sting someone who's evil or, or, or who is good and is not wanting to do anything wrong that's very common for like for you to see a very advanced yogi and have a snake crawl right over him in the middle of the night and neither one of them even re realize who who the other one was <laughs> you know so back to south america being the land of the snakes yeah this is the other thing is america america was not named after the fourth or fifth guy who founded amerigo vespucci that's a silly Amer like history school book answer. 
The real reason America is called America is because it's Amaruka. It's the land of Amaru, the land of the serpent people. That's the real re that's the real name of America if you ask Manly P. Hall, and he was like an pretty much the expert on all these things. Um so yeah, literally the name of America. I mean, why would we have named it after the fourth or fifth guy to find it, Amerigo Vespucci? And why wouldn't we call it Amerigo? Because that's his name, you know? So it doesn't make sense naming America after Amerigo Vespucci who was just insignificant in every way. So the real answer to that question is Amaruka. Um, furthermore, uh, snakes are symbols of longevity and immortality in general, okay? This, this is important. Um, in Peru, the word for serpent is Amaru. Serpents are a symbol of longevity. In India, the word for immortality and longevity is Amar. Weird. Amar, immortality, longevity. The symbol of it, the snake, is called Amaru in Peru. Just another coincidence? Gotta wonder. And you know, the Ramayan literally describes South America and South American landmarks. Um, but that would be something for a whole other video if you guys are interested in that. But there's obvious evidence of interaction of these cultures. Um, and, you know, like, this is why snakes symbolize wisdom to all these ancient cultures, you know, and think of, uh, <clears throat> the longevity, Shiva, Shiva having serpents in his hair, you know, immortality, spiritual immortality. The reason that, uh, serpents symbolize immortality is because it's very hard to kill a snake. In fact, if you cut a snake's head off, the head will still remain alive and, there's even, you know, there's many cases where a, a dog has been playing with a dead snake head and it has bit the dog and things like that. <clears throat> I go into that in my Nakshatra course on um, the snake yoni a lot. But, um, so, it's very hard to kill a snake. This is why Scorpio, the eighth sign, the sign of the serpent, is the sign of longevity and the sign of death and the struggle for survival. Because that's what a snake will do. It will struggle till the very end. Um... And that's why the eighth house and the eighth sign and Scorpio symbolize the soul's journey through the many lives it has because nothing really dies. You see, like it's the sign of longevity because we don't really die in this body. We go into another one, just like how a snake sheds its skin and, you know, takes on a new form. Even the eighth sign, even the number eight is an infinity, is like this serpent coil ending just going into creation, now going back into the astral realms, now going back into creation, now going back in. So even the number eight symbolizes this. And wow. snakes are associated obviously with wisdom and um, they go into the ground, they hide and even treasure and gold and all these things as well. Um, but yeah, this is where it gets really fascinating is that the Ramayana literally describes like the Nazca lines and it describes particular landmarks um, in Indonesia, in Australia, and in South America, like with great detail. So that would be something for another video if you guys would be interested to know about that. But this, we're getting a little off topic here for an astrology channel. But I mean, I just wanted to share this stuff because this brings a lot of significance to anyone who's learning astrology. You're reading about your planets and your Rahu and Ketu placements. You you might be someone in Ohio reading about this and then think about, wow, 3,000 years ago or more, so you might have been incarnated then, learning about your Rahu and Ketu placements at the Serpent Mound or at some other one of these complexes. So, yeah, uh, America has a very fascinating past. It is definitely the land of the serpent people. And it's interesting how uh, snakes symbolize waking up um, and enlightenment. And a lot of people do feel that the USA is part of what has to get, what has to wake up and lead the spiritual rebirth for the new age. And if not, the rest, you know, in a lot of ways, we're in a lot of trouble. And so however you want to look at it. See, Christians probably, as I was saying that, I'm thinking Christians probably look at this whole serpent thing as like, wow, America is the land of the devil and evil and all that whatever um serpents have mul multiple layers of symbolism but you guys can think on that interpret that in your own way i just wanted to share the cool astrological connections to this site that have not been mentioned previously thanks you guys 
Oh, and yeah, please like and subscribe or whatever. And uh, sign up for my Patreon if you want to learn real astrology. All right, thanks, you guys.